Welcome to this Iowa gubernatorial debate between incumbent Republican Governor Kim Reynolds and Democratic challenger Fred Hubble. Voters here in the Quad Cities have a lot of important decisions to make at the polls in November. Today, more than ever, it's important to have a source you can depend on for real local news, with stories that are covered by and written by journalists who live and work right here in the Quad Cities, with transparency and without bias. At TV6, we won't endorse candidates or tell you who we think you should vote for. We believe you, our viewers, can and should make your own decisions. But that said, it is our responsibility to provide the information you need to make the decisions that are right for you. So thank you for watching and doing your part to become an informed voter. We hope to see you at the polls November 6th. Live from the TV6 studios, KWQC presents the final 2018 Iowa gubernatorial debate. Here's David Nelson. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this third and final 2018 Iowa Governor Debate. I'm David Nelson, evening anchor for KWQC and moderator. We are proud to host this debate along with our great TV sister station, KCRG in Cedar Rapids and the Quad City Times. We want to welcome our viewers watching both on TV and online in communities across the state of Iowa. Our debate today features Republican Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, and her Democratic challenger, Fred Hubble. Governor Reynolds is the 43rd governor of Iowa and the state's first female governor. She previously served as the state's lieutenant governor from 2011 to 2017. Before that, the governor served in the Iowa State Senate. Democratic challenger Fred Hubble is an attorney, business person, and former chairman of Yonkers Department Stores. He has served as acting director of the Department of Economic Development of Iowa and chair of the Iowa Power Fund Board of Directors. Our panelists today include Jenna Jackson, anchor and reporter for KWQC-TV6, Forrest Saunders, anchor and reporter with KCRG, and Aaron Murphy, Des Moines Bureau Chief for the Quad City Times and Lee Enterprises. Now, before we begin, we're going to go over some of the debate rules. Each candidate will get to make a one-minute opening statement, and then we'll begin with the questions. Each panelist will direct a question to one or both candidates. Candidates get one minute for the response, and the opposing candidate gets a 30-second rebuttal. The moderator will decide if more time will be allotted for more rebuttal by a candidate. We held a coin toss moments ago to determine the candidate who will have the first opening statement and first question. Coin toss was won by Governor Reynolds, who will now begin by presenting her opening statement. Governor. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for hosting this morning's debate. And to Iowans who have joined us, good morning. I'm a fifth-generation Iowan, and I chose to live, work, and raise my family in a state I love, a state where if you work hard and dream big, anything is possible. My story is the Iowa story, where a small-town girl, daughter of a factory worker, farmer, stay-at-home mom, who waited tables, checked groceries, and never gave up on her dream of getting her college degree is today serving Iowans at the highest level as the first female governor. I understand the challenges that everyday Iowans face because I face them myself. And that's why as governor, I've led on cutting taxes, growing jobs and wages and opportunities, investing in education and opportunities for Iowans and finding solutions for Iowans' health care needs. Iowa is working. U.S. News and World Report says we're number one in the country. But I say we're just getting started. Mr. Hubble. Thank you, Governor Reynolds. Thanks to our moderators, and thanks to our fellow Iowans watching this morning. I'm a fifth generation Iowan. I love our state, and I'm running for governor to change its direction by putting people first. For me, it starts with Tucker. Tucker's an optimistic young man. He suffered a tragic accident. It could have happened to any one of us. But Tucker was forced into privatized Medicaid because he was a quadriplegic and he lost his in-home care. We can do better for Tucker and the thousands of Iowans like him who have been harmed by Medicaid privatization. We can do better for the 40% of Iowans who are working hard every day and yet they can't make ends meet because our wages are so low and our incomes are flat. Let's work together and put people first in our state. It's, for Governor Reynolds, it's all about more of the same. But for all Iowans, it's time for a change. All right, thank you, Mr. Hubble. And now our first question by Jenna Jackson. 
Governor Reynolds, good morning. The fetal heartbeat law you signed bans abortions once a heartbeat is detected, but doctors say a heartbeat is detectable often before a woman knows she's pregnant. A recent poll of Iowans from Selzer and Company shows more than half the citizens in the state believe the law goes too far. What do you say to those who feel the law would wrongly deprive women the chance to make an educated choice about their own health care? Well, there are passionate and strong feelings on both sides of this issue, and for me, I'm pro-life and have said as governor that I will never fight, stop fighting on behalf of the unborn. And for me, if a beating heart determines death, if a, when a heart stops beating, if that determines death, then a beating heart indicates life. And I'm never going to stop fighting for the unborn. What I think is extreme is Fred's position, who uh, uh, agrees with or supports taxpayer dollars going to a company that supports um, late-term abortion, abortion on demand, and I don't believe that's what Iowans want. Mr. Rubble? Same question? You get a, a rebuttal? Oh, excuse me. I've worked most of my life to support access to health care for people all across our state. I served on the Planned Parenthood board in proving access to low-income people all across Iowa. I served on the Mercy Hospital Catholic board to expand access to health care. My wife and I helped Broadlands Hospital expand mental health services. I've worked a lot of my life trying to help all Iowans get access to quality health care. And this governor just keeps reducing access to health care with bills like the one you just described. We need to do everything possible to make sure all Iowans get quality, affordable health care. Governor? Yes, uh, well, we are expanding uh, access for women, and that's why last year I signed a bill that would bring in Unity Point to provide additional coverage and access for women all across our state. And it's why I'll be uh, sponsoring a bill next year that will allow Iowans and women to purchase their birth control pills uh, from a pharmacist. All right, Governor, thank you very much. Next question now, Aaron Murphy. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, Governor Reynolds. You and the Republican-led legislature this past year, you mentioned the tax cuts that you employed. Um, would you like to see more tax cuts implemented uh, in the coming session if, if you're elected, if you're reelected? Well, as someone who had to work nights and weekends to make ends meet, I'm going to fight every single day to help Iowans keep more of their hard-earned money. I cut taxes. Fred, on the other hand, wants to raise taxes. He wants to raise taxes on hard-working Iowans and families and small businesses. I don't believe that's the direction that we should go. I believe that we should reduce taxes and, pro and provide a smaller government, and he wants to do just the opposite. So I will continue to fight for Iowans, to fight for them to keep more of their hard money and we're seeing uh, the economy grow because of reducing taxes we're seeing wages increase we have a balanced budget a surplus of 127 million dollars and we're going to continue to give that back to Iowans uh, and we're going to continue to fight for that I'm going to yes do you expect more should we expect more tax yep. cuts under I said last year is that sustainable given the fluctuations we've had in the state budget the last yeah, well, year? Well, we're seeing the results of reduced taxes and wages increasing, and that's being reflected in a growing economy. We have a balanced budget, $127 million surplus. Uh, the Revenue Estimating Conference just indicated we have $100 million more that will go into the fiscal year 19 budget. We did it by being fiscally responsible, by maintaining our priorities of education, health care, and public safety. And that's the same approach that we'll take next year to help Iowans keep more of their hard-earned money. Mr. Hobble, do you have a response to that? I've been very clear. The uh, Iowans who are in the middle class and, and low-income categories and small businesses, they're the ones that deserve a tax cut. All the governor's plans put all the money into the hands of big corporations and, and wealthy Iowans. They don't need the tax cuts. They already have the lowest tax rates in our state. It's not fair. We need to fiscally manage our budget properly so we get rid of the yo-yo impact that's going on in our budgeting. And we need to make sure that the middle class and low-income families get, the, get all the benefit of our tax breaks. So you and you said in a recent uh, TV appearance that you would repeal all the income tax cuts. Can you can you clarify what you meant? But now you're saying you would like to see them for low income Iowans. What that was passed would you keep? What would you like to repeal? What, if it, I, what, what exactly would you do? When I said that, I was responding to a question about the tariffs. We had two billion dollars of tariffs at that time. The first job of a governor is to be fiscally responsible, and if those tariffs continue or get worse then we're going to have to take a look at all these tax cuts. The governor can promise all the tax cuts that she wants, 
but you have to balance a budget, and we should do it on a predictable basis. We have a yo-yo with the budget numbers going up and down. She can't explain why we had a big surplus. Well, all we know is it's a lot bigger than what was expected. We don't know what's behind those numbers. I'm going to produce a balanced budget regardless of what's going on with the tariffs, regardless of what's going on in our economy, and I'm going to favor a middle-class tax cut. No, I'm not just talking about it. We have reduced taxes. A historic tax cut last legislative session. Again, the, balance, the budget is balanced, $127 million surplus. Fred, when you were the CEO of Yonkers, he likes to talk about uh, fiscal responsibility. The IRS said you owed, uh, that Yonkers owed $9 million in back taxes, penalty, and interest. That doesn't sound like fiscal responsibility to me. The budget is balanced. We have a surplus. We're reducing taxes. Fred wants to raise taxes. He said it. He doubled down on Iowa Press two days ago. I'm sorry, he also indicated he didn't know. Okay. Next question now from Boris Saunders with KCRG. Good morning to both of you. Thank you very much for being here. Governor Reynolds, this first question that I have is for you. Following the death of Molly Tibbetts, an Iowa student whose alleged killer is an undocumented immigrant, Governor, your first statement on that death brought up the need for immigration reform. The comment was chastised for coming off as political too soon in the grieving process. Do you have any regrets about making that statement? I have been very consistent in calling on Washington, D.C. to implement immigration reform. It has to be done. I said we need to, they need to do what we've done here in Iowa, and that's where two parties can come together, put Iowans first, and focus on getting things done on behalf of Iowans. Almost every single bill that I passed this last legislative, that I had in my condition of the state this last legislative session, passed with bipartisan support. What they need to do in Congress is they need to quit taking their ball and go home, they need to get to the table, and they need to find solutions to a immigration system that is broken. This was a tragic death, and we don't we don't want to see any more of that. Any death is, is tragic. But they are responsible for immigration reform. They need to get something done, and they need to get to the table, work on it, and, uh, and reform a system that's broken. As a follow-up, do you feel like you injected politics into a situation that might have been way too soon in the grieving this process? This isn't about politics. It's about policy, and I've been consistent with that uh, ever since that I've been lieutenant governor and ever since that I've been governor, we need to get immigration reform done. Congress needs to act, and they're not. They need to put their differences aside, they need to come to the table, and they need to find solutions to a system that's broken. It's outdated, they need to streamline it, they need to look at uh, workforce, work-based visas, so they need to, it's, it's their responsibility and they need to get it done. All right, time's up. Mr. Hubble. In response to your question, I think the governor's statement was completely political, the first statement she put out. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what the Molly Tibbetts family said. Let's not politicize this. We had a tragic happening on our family. Give us time to grieve. It's not about immigration. It's not about politics. It's about public safety. That's what's the, the, the issue here. This governor has been cutting the public safety budget for the last two years, $11 million. If we really want to make people safe in our communities, in our homes, and on our streets, let's fund public safety. Let's listen to our public safety officers. We all want secure borders. We all want strong borders. We want Washington to deal with immigration. And we all want to make sure that illegal immigrants and immigrants with criminal records are not allowed into our state. But we need to be a welcoming state. And let's not politicize crime. Let's talk about public safety. That's how we can solve crime. That's how we can make families feel safe, by dealing with public safety and funding it and supporting it on our streets, in our homes, in our communities, and at work. All right, thank you, Mr. Hubble. Forrest, a second. You have another May question? I have an opportunity since he... No, what he... I'm sorry, Governor, we're, we're moving on. Well, I have a question for you, Mr. Hubble. Uh, Democrats accuse Republicans of using Molly Tibbetts' death as a political opportunity, as you just said, soon after her death. Now, can you guarantee that following a mass shooting in Iowa, you would not immediately discuss gun control reform? You know, I've been on a hijacked airplane with three terrorists pointing automatic weapons at my face, threatening my wife's life and my life every single day. I've seen somebody be shot no farther away from me than you are. I know what that, stuff, what that experience is like. I'm very sympathetic to the people who have to go through those tragic experiences. Nobody should have to do that. But I'm a strong supporter of public safety. I'm not going to politicize events, but I'm going to politicize public safety because we need to support public safety in our, in our communities. That's why I'm not going to be cutting all the funding for our local communities who are forced to either limit public safety or raise property taxes. I'm going to fund public safety at the state level. so we have. We have park rangers in our parks, so people are comfortable and safe in our parks. 
so that we have troopers at night on the roads rather than the five we have there now. So that we have law enforcement who actually gets to do their job investigating and solving crimes all across our state. Governor. First thing he wants to do is raise Iowa's taxes, and that's going to kill the economy that we see growing right now. He wants to raise taxes. He wants to increase onus regulations. Uh, he wants to repeal right to work. You talk about a economy job-killing strategy. That's what Fred Hubble will bring. I'm proud of what our law enforcement have done. I'm proud of the services that they provide in keeping our communities safe and Iowans safe. And that's one of the reasons that Iowa is the best place to live, work, and raise a family. And we have record investments in public safety and we're going to continue to grow the economy we're going to continue to invest in our priorities and that's education public health and public safety another question on immigration from Forrest this is for both of you and Governor Reynolds you'll start this one this week President Trump suggested using National Guard troops to close our border with Mexico in order to keep out thousands of migrants from Central America the president called many of them quote bad people and said the US does not want them here do you think it's worth committing National Guard troops to closing our border? Uh, I would have to look at the situation. There's various aspects that I can um, send National Guard troops down to the border, but we do need to protect our borders. Uh, it's important that we support legal immigration. We have over a million immigrants, legal immigrants, that come to this country every year. And so we need to make sure that we're... Um, supporting legal immigration, not illegal immigration. And the number one duty as the governor is to make sure that I keep uh, Iowans safe. And so if the need was asked, it would de depend on what they were um, asking our resources to be used for, but I would be open to sending National Guard down to the border. Mr. Hubble, same question. I'm not going to politicize our National Guard or putting them in harm's way for political reasons. If there's a real serious national threat, to our, to our borders, of course we'll send down the National Guard, but not for political reasons. These people do a great job for our state, and they shouldn't be having their lives put in harm's way for politics. We need to support the National Guard. We need to support public safety. But we don't have to raise taxes. The governor can claim all day I'm going to raise taxes. What I'm going to do is change the priorities in this state. There's plenty of money in the state budget. We're just not prioritizing how it should be spent. I want to prioritize education, health care, public safety and our, and our communities with, with economic opportunities for our communities to grow. If we stop the wasteful corporate tax giveaway she's been giving away for nine years now, over $100 million a year, that's a lot of money. We could be investing in the people of our state, including the National Guard, including more park rangers, including more cops on the street. Let's have secure borders, but let's not put our National Guard in harm's way for political reasons. All right, next question now from Jenna Jackson. Uh, this question is for both of you. Mr. Hubble, we'll start with you. Uh, recently in Eldridge, Iowa, a 12-year-old brought a gun into his school, pointed it at a teacher, pulled the trigger. Luckily, the safety was on. No one was hurt. A bill was recently passed requiring all schools to have a high-quality plan, more counselors to the school, and added more flexibility to funding in schools. But this student still entered this school with the gun. Tell us one thing you would do as governor to immediately make school safer. Well, you know, that's a very important question. As I said earlier, I've experienced automatic weapons pointed at me. I've experienced somebody getting shot just a few feet away from me. So I have a lot of sympathy for these young students because they're afraid, and that's not right. But what do we need to do? We need to make sure that we have a um, focus on public safety and gun safety in our state. I fully support the Second Amendment. You know, I grew up in a family where we were hunting all the time. My father had guns. I hunted with my brothers. My wife and I have been pheasant hunting before. But that doesn't mean you ignore gun safety and public safety. We don't need more guns in our schools. What we need is a commitment to gun safety. I talk to a lot of people traveling around the state. A lot of NRA members come up to me and they say, we need more gun safety in our state. We need to make sure our gun, a lot of them suggest all guns should be locked up. They keep their guns locked up. We should consider that. Same thing with child care. Right now, just last year, the governor stopped a DHS bill that would have allowed child care providers or would have required them to actually lock their guns up when they bring people from outside their, their community into their homes. Uh, we should require time, that kind of activity time, rather Mr. Hubble. exposing I'm young sorry. people to unlocked guns. Governor, Same you question. respond. Yeah, well, first of all, as a mother and as, as a grandmother and as a mom of a teacher, of course we want to make sure that when we drop our children off at school, we have every expectation of picking them up safely at the end of the day. And I am so proud of what we were been able to do last year 
with comprehensive mental health care reform because a lot of times that's at the root of the issue with individuals. There's something that caused causing them to act out. Comprehensive mental health care reform that built on the progress we started in 2013. In addition to that, we provide a flexibility for school counselors, for, for mental health advocates, and for social workers, and a teenage suicide prevention bill that helps educators get the training that they need to identify early warning signs for mental illness so that we can get our young people the services that they need to get them healthy and uh, so that they are able to learn and to have a great quality of life. So we'll continue to build on that. We'll continue to work with schools to make sure that they have a high quality okay. program in place. Time, um, Governor. Yeah, Governor Reynolds, uh, has your administration provided enough funding for school safety? They, there is funding. In addition to that, there's also been um, a federal grants that we've been able to draw down because we know, especially with mental illness, that this is so important. And historic investment in K-12 education. We're fourth in the country. Only three other states have provided more funding in K-12 education than Iowa. But the flexibility that we provided last year with some of the categorical funding allows schools to utilize those resources for mental health counselors, social workers, to, to help help educators see, um, uh, help, help identify some of the early warning signs. And so we're going to continue to make that a priority. It has been a priority, uh, and I'm proud of what we were able to do last year with both the teenage suicide prevention and the comprehensive mental health care reform passed unanimously. Every single legislature, legislator uh, in the House and the Senate supported that and looking forward to uh, really implementing those great ideas. Mr. Hubble, do you believe school funding, uh, school safety funding, is where it needs to be? Well, actually, what I what I'm afraid of is when I'm listening to what the governor is talking about in terms of mental health and crim and criminality. It sounds to me like she's stereotyping mental health as the people people who have mental health issues as the ones who are committing all these crimes. It's not true. It's not fair to the mental health community to be, to be saying that. Yes, we have a criminal issue in our state and our in our country. We have a public safety issue. If we properly fund our schools, which despite what the governor says, we're not doing it. We've had eight years in a row of about a 1.3% average increase in student funding in our schools. Inflation has been 25 to 3% each of those eight years. That's why our, our, our teachers and the people in the school buildings are asked to do more and more every year with less resources. In fact, in Old Wine, Iowa, a teacher there told us about her, her textbooks from middle school. They're 10 to 12 years old, pages are falling out, and there's no money for new books. We need to properly fund our schools, and if we properly fund our schools, we could have counselors in every school building, as well as nurses and people who have mental health experience. Governor, 30 seconds. Yeah, we are properly funding our schools, and we're going to continue to do better. We've not cut education. The last administration to cut education was the Culver administration that Fred was a part of. They did a 10% across the board cut, not only higher education, but K-12 education, and then didn't fully fund what they had promised their schools. We are funding education. We're working hard to grow the economy. We're seeing incomes rise, and with a growing economy, we're going to be able to continue to invest uh, in our young people. And it is absolutely unconscionable for you to say to me that when I talk about passing mental health reform, it's a reflection on them that they're criminals. That's unconscionable and it's ridiculous. All right, thank you, Governor. Next. Well, the Governor has cut funding for the region schools and the community colleges. Three years in a row. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hubble. Next question now from Aaron. Uh, we want to move on to uh, labor laws. Governor Reynolds, uh, the, the significant changes that were made to Iowa's collective bargaining laws were done before you took office under former Governor Terry Branstad. Um, I'm wondering if you support those changes nonetheless, and, and if you do, why were they necessary? If you talk to a lot of teachers, they'll say all the changes have done is make it hard for them to negotiate for their benefits. Were those changes necessary? Well, what those changes did was actually brought taxpayers to the table and gave them a seat at the table. But most importantly, what it did is it provides schools and local governments in the state the flexibility to manage the resources that they have so that we don't see another 10% across the board cut. It gives local school districts and the administrators the opportunity to manage the revenue that they get, to reward teachers that take on additional responsibilities. And they have the option to negotiate just like they did before 
sure if both sides agree. You have seen some of the school districts go ahead and put in place uh, a five-year contract under the old system. You have actually seen some of the school districts that have rewarded uh, teachers like the special education teachers who take on additional responsibility to give them an increase in their salaries. So I have confidence in uh, the administration and the, at the local and the state and in our school districts to make the decisions that they need to make. I am so appreciative of what our educators do for our young people. My daughter's a right, teacher Governor, that's and time. they make a difference. That's time for the response. Mr. Hillary, response, why not let administrators have that flexibility? Well, let's go back to the mid-1970s. There's an agreement between Bob Ray and a bipartisan legislature controlled by Republicans to, for the teachers and the state workers to give up the right to strike in exchange for getting collective bargaining. It was a trade. It was a common agreement. It's been that way for over 45 years. It's worked just fine in our state. We didn't need to change it. In fact, I think it was purely for political reasons they wanted to do that. They wanted to reduce the, the, the impact of, of labor unions in the state to strengthen the Republican Party. It had nothing to do with being good for our state. And, and uh, they actually violated the agreement that was put in place in the 1970s when they gave up the right to strike in return for getting collective bargaining. Now, teachers, state workers don't have the right to strike or collective bargaining. It's not fair. And the next thing the governor's going to do, if she keeps control of the legislature and wins this race, she's going to take away IPERS for future teachers. That's exactly what the Republicans have done in several other states, and she's been following that same agenda. The first year they take away collective bargaining, the second year they take away collective bargaining for police, That's time and take away trouble. the benefit to find time to I hope I, all Iowans are tuning in because this gives me an opportunity to address this head on. I am a strong supporter of IPERS. I've worked in local government for 19 years. I have colleagues all across the state. Again, my daughter is a teacher. These are promises made and promises kept. We will not take away offers. This is a promise that we made. People are making their retirement decisions based on it. And I want to assure Iowans that we won't. You know what? When you've ran out of ideas and you have nothing to run on except for raising taxes, That's time, raising taxes I'm sorry. you go to scare taxes. Next question from Forrest. One more real quick, sorry. For Mr. Hubble, um, on those collective bargaining laws, then would you make an attempt to reverse those changes? And, and the governor mentioned the right to work law as well in the state. Would you advocate for uh, changing that? I think we need to work with the legislature to restore Chapter 20 just the way it was before and to restore the bar collective bargaining rights for our teachers. As I said, there was no reason to, to change those other than purely politics. It makes good sense to restore those rights to our hardworking families in this country and in our, in our state. And by the way, the governor talks about current IPERS people. She has made no promises to protect IPERS for future state employees or future teachers. And I will do that because it's a very well-managed program. It's one of the best in the country. There's no need to make hardly any significant changes. And, and what about right to work? If the legislature determines that the right to work bill should be passed and they give me a bill that's good for small businesses and it's good for our economy, I will sign that bill. Higher taxes, more regulation, repealing right to work. Talk about bringing the economy to a screeching halt. Again, his only option is going to be to raise taxes. And we are growing the economy. The IPERS pension is about 80% funded. We're one of the best in the country. But the way that we keep that funded, the way we get to 100% funding like it was when I actually served on the IPERS board, is by growing the economy, balancing the budget, having a surplus, and helping Iowans keep more of their hard-earned money. That's how we're going to in, uh, ensure future Iowans that that pension is going to be there for right. them. Thank you, Governor. I'm, I'm sorry we need to move on to the next question now. Reduces funding for us, we'll start with Mr. Hubble. So these are some topics that are focused on President Trump and some of the things that he said in recent months. So starting with you, Mr. Hubble, and then uh, Governor Reynolds, you will have a chance to answer this question as well. Following the Kavanaugh hearings, President Trump suggested that the hashtag MeToo movement was, quote, very dangerous and unfairly threatened an entire class of powerful men. Do you agree with these comments? Why or why not? I'm running for governor of Iowa. I'm not running to, to have anything to do with anything outside of Iowa. We need to make sure that Iowa is the kind of a state that creates opportunities for everybody to be successful, which means we need to have the right priorities. This governor keeps talking about raising taxes. I want to stop wasteful spending. 
and invest in education, invest in health care. There's plenty of money in our budget. We don't need to raise taxes. We need to be smarter about how we're spending our money and have the right priorities. Mr. Hull, I'm going to have to try and redirect you to that question because that's what this is all about, answering these questions. So do you agree with the President's comments that, uh, and I'm going to restate it here, hashtag MeToo movement was very dangerous and unfairly threatened an entire class of powerful men? I understand that you are not running for President, but Iowa is a member of the union. And I would like to get your comments on that. I think the Me Too movement is bringing a lot of good ideas and, and recognition of some, some challenges that we're facing in our country that have not been properly addressed. Sexual harassment, sexual assault in our country has been prevalent. Look at our state legislature. It's a toxic work environment because of sexual assault, sexual intimidation, and sexual harassment. We need to stop that activity. We need a governor who's going to stand up and change things. She's been in the legislature and the governor's office for 10 years, and then we have really no progress. It's still a toxic situation. We need to have the make sure that every iron is treated with equal respect and dignity and it's actually followed through. Thank you, Mr. Hull. That's time. Party. And now the same question, 60 seconds for the governor. And let's just remember, I cut taxes. He's the one that wants to raise taxes. So let's not forget that. I cut taxes, Fred. I said when I was sworn in uh, as the governor, as the 43rd governor of this state, that unfortunately you can't legislate morality, treating people with respect and dignity, but it starts at the top and it starts with changing the culture. And I said that I have a zero tolerance policy and if that policy is violated, you will be heard and action will be taken. And I did that. When that policy was violated, I took action. I'm proud when little girls come into my office to set them in my chair so that they know that they have a place and that their voice will be heard and that they can do or be anything that they want to be. And if you look at the faces of my administration, you'll see strong, bold women that are leading agencies all across the state. I do. I want to be as specific as possible here. So I want to see if you agree with the comments that the president made that when he suggested the Me Too movement was very dangerous and unfairly threatened an entire class of powerful men. I believe that uh, we—it it is a, we've seen a paradigm shift, and I appreciate women who are finding the courage to step up. I believe they should be heard, but I believe both sides should be heard. So I believe that it's, it's, it's encouraging to see women find the courage to step up. It's important that we listen, but it's also important that we hear both sides of the story. So that's what I think. I think that we need to make sure that we hear from both. I have another question for both of you, and we started with uh, Mr. Hubble, so this one will be directed towards you, Governor Reynolds, first. On Thursday, President Trump praised a Montana congressman who pleaded guilty to physically assaulting a news reporter. The president said the congressman is, quote, my kind of guy, and indicated the assault may have won the election for that congressman. What's your reaction to those remarks by the president? Well, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think that we need to treat people with dignity and respect. I think it starts at the top, and I think that that's really important. I can't be held accountable for what every individual says, but I can be held accountable for what I do and how I lead. And I have made it very clear that it's about changing the culture, it's about taking responsibility, it's about making sure that state workers know what the process is, and that if they experience uh, any kind of uh, discrimination or sexual ha harassment, they know what the process is, they'll be heard, and if it has been violated, they'll be held accountable. So I don't agree with that, and I think that we need to lead, and I can be responsible for myself, and I am. Mr. Hubble? I think those kind of statements and those kind of references to the news media are very harmful to our, our democracy. We need the news media to be an independent arbiter of what's going on in our country, um, and, and, I, and I think those statements are, are going exactly in the wrong direction. What we need to do is recognize, though, that our governor has recently said she's not going to do regular weekly news conferences anymore. And I think we need to have regular, I've committed to do those. And it's important that we have those so the media knows what's going on and so people can hear from the media what's actually going on rather than just from the candidates or the, or the politicians themselves. And back to your previous question, we need a whistleblower process in our state. Every public company in the country has a whistleblower process. What does that do? That allows people, if they see a grievance or they feel that they've been aggrieved in the workplace, they can raise their issue outside their HR channel, outside their, their, their respective person they report to, goes to an independent third party, it gets investigated, it gets reviewed, and it gets decided. It eliminates the intimidation. That's what we need to have in state government, just like public companies do. Governor Reynolds. Of all the women out there, Fred, I took action. 
I haven't heard you take action, and this is not a partisan issue, but Senator Bolton's still serving, um, and so I did take action. And if you go back and look at the clip, I said that um, I, I will hold press, weekly press conferences. I am so accessible. I'm all over the state, everywhere I go. Uh, media and individuals have an opportunity to ask me questions on anything that they want. So uh, I am extremely accessible, proud of that, and will continue to be. You said that you hold them all the time, but you did not commit to no, I, weekly. No, I did. In the debate, they, they point blank asked in the first debate that we did, if you're elected, are you going to hold weekly press conferences? And I said, absolutely, just as I've done. But you said a couple of weeks ago that you're not going to hold weekly press conferences. You, you didn't commit to it. No, I did. And by the way, well, if I, there's I've any asked, ambiguity, I, I, I will. Regardless of what the governor says, I have asked for Nate Bolton to resign. So I have taken steps. Very good. You didn't say it last week. Thank you. Me. Me. Thank you both. Moving on to the next topic now with Jenna Jackson. We're going to switch gears uh, over to mental health now. Um, Mr. Hubble, we'll start with you. Uh, part of your mental health platform is to provide more funding for mental health programs and allow local communities the authority to invest in different forms of uh, mental health programs. How much money will you put forth? Where is that money going to come from? Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, our current mental health system is very expensive and ineffective. It's a crisis growing all over our state. As a matter of fact, 73% of Iowans said that very recently. And then the governor cut the budget for DHS, which oversees mental health. The fact of the matter is, what are we doing with mental health and substance abuse now? We're forcing those people into our county jails, into our prisons, and into our emergency rooms. The most expensive places in the state for them to be. Day after day after the day, they're costing our state a lot of money and they're getting lower quality service. Another example, right here in Davenport, the mental health court. I have visited that mental health court. That's where people are focused on rehabilitation rather than incarceration. I saw a young man there, talked with him, met him with the mental, mental health court people. He got a job after a year and a half in mental health court, kept him out of jail. Now he has a full-time job. That court, according to Justice Katie, saves our, saves our state $300,000 a year. But the governor keeps cutting funding for the judiciary so he can hardly keep it open other than by using volunteers. We need more mental health courts. Thank you, Mr. Hubble. That's time. Money I'm sorry, Mr. Spending. Hubble, that's time. If I, if I can, Mr. Hubble, where's the money going to come from? Well, we stop putting people in the jails. You go to Lynn County, you go to Johnson County, you go to Polk County, they're saving money because they have jail diversion programs, crisis intervention training, mobile crisis units. They've have documented they're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars for their community. I just gave you the mental health court, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars. We don't necessarily need to spend more. We just need to be smarter about what we're doing, focus more on prevention and continuum care for people. All right, Governor, response. Yeah, I'm really proud of, the again, the comprehensive mental health care reform that we passed this last legislative session. We put over $2 billion into mental health care. Uh, we've uh, had 150 Iowans that are now covered for mental health that wasn't covered before. We're providing six access centers across the state, which is almost like urgent care for mental health. And the programs that uh, Fred talks about are programs that we're working on. This is a system that he thinks is so broken, but yet every single legislator voted for this bill that builds on the success that we started in 2013. I'm proud of what we've been able to do. We're gonna continue to enhance it. Also, it's a public-private partnership. So when we talk about the number of beds, we're increasing the number of beds, we address that in the legislation we passed. But Bettendorf also just uh, went broke ground last uh, oh, a couple months ago for a new facility, Eagle Ridge, that'll bring 75 new beds, uh, make them available, and then Mercy is also bringing 100 beds on, on board too. So that'll be 175 additional beds that will be available for Iowans next year. Right, that's time, Governor. Thank you. Uh, this one is for both of you. This time we'll start with Governor Reynolds. Uh, Governor Reynolds, according to Mental Health America, childhood depression is steadily increasing, but for most of the kids there's insufficient or no treatment. First of all, do you agree with that? Well, Mental Health America also ranks Iowa number sixth in the country when it comes to mental health, and over the last three years, we've increased each year. So we are moving in the right direction. And that's the reason that I um, signed an executive order to create a children's mental health system. Right now, we don't have one, and that's uh, unconscionable. We need to do that. I've created a board. They'll report back to me in December, and we'll start implementing uh, a children's mental health system that'll talk about how we'll fund it and sustain it and put that together moving forward. So I'm excited about that and it will build on 
really the adult mental health reform that we put in place. So we've got a great foundation to work from. Many of the same people that served on the complex needs study group is also serving on the children's mental health uh, board. And so I'm looking forward to implementing that and helping uh, young people get the, the, the treatment that they deserve. Mr. Obel, same question. Well, you have to look behind some of the statements that the governor likes to talk about. That study she referred to studied the years 2013 to 2015. When did we close the mental health institutes? Late 2015. When did we bring in Medicaid privatization and, and the disaster there? After 2015. So we've had a, we've had a sea change in mental health in our state, and, and all of which happened after the study she referred to. And 73% of Iowa said in January it's in crisis, and then she cut the budget. What's really going on is I met with some school teachers in central Iowa recently. They told me in the elementary school they teach in, the mental health and substance abuse issues in elementary school are just going out of the roof the last four years, just going like this. And yet we don't put adequate funding in our schools so we can have counselors in our schools or nurses in our schools. There's a lot of things we can do better. Her bill, frankly, just creates more unfunded mandates for local communities. So in order to implement the bill that she's talking about, her mental health bill, either local communities raise their property taxes or they fire school teachers, they fire police, and they fire and they fire the firefighters. That's a, not a very good right, choice. Mr. Hubble, that's community. time. She should be funding it at the I'm state I'm sorry, level. Mr. Hubble, that's time. Go more ahead. scare tactics, more scare tactics, money, money, money. I have no idea except for to raise your taxes how Fred is going to even come close to paying for all of the promises that he's made. That's his answer to everything. It's more government and it's more money. And I'm telling you, Iowa taxpayers can't afford Fred Hubble. Governor, you're the one that's pushing all the increased taxes down to the local community property taxpayers. That's yeah. raising taxes yeah. on every We're funding Iowa. it. The managed care uh, contract negotiations that we just implemented actually takes into account the comprehensive mental health care reform and it helps us start to implement the initiatives that your your running mate voted for every single legislator you keep talking about how insignificant this is but yet every single legislator everyone voted for this and it builds on the progress that we made in 2013 and if you say it enough and tell people enough they're going to start to believe it but the fact of the matter is you're talking about stuff and we're getting things done we are I right. have led thank on you governor this, we'll have to stop it there do you done. have a response mr hubble yes thank you the governor's bill has a lot of nice words in it, which is why a lot of people voted for it. But there's no funding, there's no action, nothing has changed. She's just pushing costs and ideas down to local communities. They don't have the money to do these things. I talk to these people all across the state. They're not implementing any of those suggestions in that bill because they don't have the money for it and the state's not giving them any money. A good example, we used to have mental health covered by Magellan. We paid them 7%. When the governor uh, implemented Medicaid privatization. She took out Magellan, moved mental health into the Medicaid system. Now we're paying 12 to 15 percent to for-profit companies. That's five percent more that we're that, that we're paying now, and the service for mental health people in our state is worse All right. than it was. That's time, Mr. Hubble. I, I'm sorry, both of you will have to leave that right that. there. We'll move on to the next question from Aaron. We'll move on, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about jobs in the economy this morning. Uh, this is a question for both of you, and we'll start with you, Mr. Hubble. Um, Iowa's unemployment level is actually in good shape and continues to decline, but you have a lot of businesses who say they have openings and can't find the workers now to fill those positions. What specific policies would you advocate for that would help those businesses and maybe help Iowans uh, find better paying jobs than they already have? Well, you know, that's a very important question. I've made it clear from the very beginning. I want to, I want to build an economy in our state that supports all Iowans. Because we don't have that today. Almost half the young people in our state go to school in the morning on free and reduced cost lunch. We're supposed to feed the world, and we can't feed our own kids. The economy is not working for a lot of people. Almost 40% of Iowans are working hard every day, many multiple jobs. They struggle to make ends meet. That's a statewide survey. If the economy is working for big companies, and wealthy individuals, but it's not working for the working class or everyday Iowans. We need to build an economy that works for everybody. How do you do that? You change the priorities of state government. You stop throwing wasteful tax giveaways out the window, and instead you invest in education, job training all across the state, so we have a more highly trained, better educated workforce. You invest in health care, so people are healthy when they go to school in the morning. When their kids go to school, they're healthy. The parents don't have to worry about them. And when the parents go to work, they, they're ready to go, and they're focused, and they're productive. 
We also need to invest in quality in life and infrastructure investments. If we change right, Mr. the Hubble, that's time. stop the wasteful Sorry, Mr. Hubble, that's we don't time. have to raise taxes, we just need to... Governor, the same priority. question for you. And, and I know you have a lot of programs that address this, but I'm also curiously specific for you. Um, is Mr. Hubble right? We have low unemployment, but is that masking maybe the fact that some Iowans are underemployed, that they have a job but aren't getting as well, income as they'd like. He talks a lot about everyday Iowans and in Iowa for everybody, but the first thing that he wants to do is raise their taxes. He said he wouldn't he wouldn't have voted for or signed the bill for affordable health care. So every piece of policy that he wants to do is hurting everyday Iowans. And I know, and I don't care if it's two hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollars in that paycheck, that is real money. That's gas, that's groceries, that's necessities. It matters. And that's why we're reducing taxes and regulations and created a pro growth and environment where we're seeing our economy grow. We're seventh highest in the country. Wages have increased for the last three quarters straight. I'm at the Iowa Business Council, the top 23 employers in the state. So this is the best economy that they've seen in 10 years. This is an economy that's growing and it's because we're reducing taxes and helping Iowans keep more of their hard-earned money. Workforce is the number one barrier to see this economy just explode and that's why we've done Future Ready Iowa, which helps our kids see the many paths to great careers here in the state of Iowa. It helps adults get the skills they need to fill the jobs that are available today right, as well as adapt That's to time. tomorrow. I'm excited about was, what we're seeing. That was 60 seconds from each of you, so we'll move on to Forrest. Next question. I want to talk a little bit about the state budget and specifically hone in on education. Um, we're going to start with you, Governor Reynolds. This is a question to both of you. So Governor Reynolds continues to tout that K through 12 education is getting a better funding increase than most of America, but the same can't be said for higher education, which recently endured an, uh, a mid-year cut, shuttering some programs. Iowa universities and community colleges say they're prepping to do more with less in the coming years. Should they? And if not, where will the money be coming from, Governor Reynolds? proud of our investment in education, as I said, fourth in the country. And we uh, am proud of what we've been able to do even with higher education. You know, that's one of the reasons when we was serving, we held tuition um, we, uh, at the same rate for two and a half years. It's one of the reasons that we have kids, more kids than any other state uh, in the country that are participating in dual enrollment, which means they take co community college classes while they're in high school. And that's helping keep the cost of higher education down. And when they do that, they're more prepared and they're more likely to succeed when they go into higher education. So, you know, we had we had a couple tough budget years. Everybody had to be held accountable. We didn't cut K-12 education when Fred's team and the Culver administration, when they were in charge, they did a 10% across the board cut, not only higher education, but K-12 education, public safety, and public health. This was less than a 2% cut, but we're growing the economy. It's going to continue to be a priority. We also have to be really careful about measuring time, um, the Governor. success of a I'm program sorry. by the sure amount of dollars that we put do into it. Do you see, it. as a quick follow-up for Governor Reynolds, do you foresee future cuts to higher education? No, because I think we're, we're seeing the economy grow. We have a surplus of $127 million. We're seeing that reflected in the revenue that's coming into the state. So we're going to continue to invest. I had to make a decision on balancing the budget. I don't get to print money. I wasn't going to raise taxes. I want to reduce taxes. And so we did hold K-12 harmless, Medicaid, and the backfill for local governments. Everybody else had to do their part. It was less than a 2% cut. The budget, the region's uh, budget is almost six billion dollars. Right, that's time. Is, I'm sorry. Is seven. Mr. Hubble, your rebuttal. Thank you. Or this will be 60 seconds. I apologize. 60 seconds. Thank you. You know, the governor keeps talking about these tax cuts. No Iowan is getting a tax cut this year. No Iowans. The middle class tax cut she talks about doesn't happen until the year 2024. If all the assumptions about Iowa's economy, the nation's economy, the geopolitics all around the world come true. No business forecasts out five years anymore. The, the likelihood that that tax cut for middle class is going to happen in 2024 is no more likely than a cow jumping over the moon. Let's be honest about it. Let's stop misleading people. The reality is we used to be number one in education. If you ask a typical Iowan today when you walk travel across the state like I do, they know we're not number one anymore. They want to be number one. We used to be proud of education. We could be again, but we need to commit to making it number one. That means that we need to focus not on graduation rates, but the fact that 30% of our kids in third grade don't meet the minimum reading requirement. 
Over half of our kids that are graduating from high school these days aren't college ready. Our ACT scores are declined three years in a row. We're not that's time, really funding that's time, Mr. Hall. education in our state. That's time. I have another question for both of you. This one, we're going to start with you, Mr. Hubble. We've already faced a series of cuts in the previous budget year. Going forward, if you had to, where would your administration look to reduce? So I'm looking for a specific answer on areas that you would cut if you had to. I've been very clear. I've mentioned several of those places already tonight. We need to stop giving away wasteful corporate tax giveaways to big corporations that don't need them, oftentimes don't even pay taxes in our state, and we could use that money to invest in education and in health care. We need to stop giving tax credits to companies like Apple and Microsoft that don't need them, didn't come here for tax credits. They came here for renewable energy and low-cost energy. It's fine if the local community wants to give tax breaks, but the state shouldn't be giving away tax credits for $20 million for 50 jobs. As a, as a follow-up to that, if you eliminate those, that's fine, but you might not have enough money to go around to support all of these initiatives that you want to fund. So you eliminate the tax credit program, that's fine, but how do you afford to pay for all of the other things that are out there in your agenda? You know, I've managed complex budgets my whole life in the public sector and the private sector, and I've always delivered on my priorities and my budget. You have to look at every single line item. I've already described several in the mental health category, and there's plenty in Medicaid where we're wasting money. Four and a half percent is what we were, were paying for Medicaid, now we're paying 12 to 15. That's a waste of money. That's going to their bottom line. That's going to for fortify the profits of managed care companies rather than actually keeping costs down in Iowa. There's a lot of ways we can save money without raising taxes, the governor keeps talking about, if we're just smarter and more effective about how we Best spend time. the money we already have. Mr. Hubble, governor. Well, those tax credit cuts that he keeps talking about, he spent those about five times over. Well, his big plan was to eliminate tax credits, and it was tax credits, his tax credit plan, uh, for disabled workers, children, and disaster victims while he kept the corporate tax credits for companies that he was personally invested in. He's been taking tax credits for four decades when he was the director of economic development. He handed out millions of dollars in tax credits. Uh, even a state report said he had absolutely no strategy whatsoever for doing that. He handed out taxpayer dollars for a company that he was personally invested in. So, you know, he talks a lot. And then you keep talking about fiscal management. Again, when he was the CEO of Yonkers, the IRS said that he owed, that, that Yonkers, owed, under his leadership, owed $7 million in back taxes, penalty, and interest. But if you had to cut, Governor. I'm sorry, we're going to have to move on. We're, we're running low on time for us. Uh, Jenna, the next topic from you. Next question. Um, this will be for both of you. Uh, we will start uh, with Governor Reynolds this time. Um, a major study recently released says the world, uh, we're talking environment now, the world has 11 years to avoid a climate change catastrophe. Uh, do you agree with climate change and the reported effect it's having across our globe? I'm proud of what we're doing in the state of Iowa, especially in our leadership position in renewable energy. We lead the country in wind. Uh, ethanol, biodiesel, and cellulosic. That's why I think it's a factor. I think that it's overstated, but I believe that we are working hard every day to do our part, uh, especially when it comes to renewables. Same Mr. question. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Thank you. Well, first of all, I knew the governor was going to be throwing a kitchen sink at me, and she certainly has not disappointed me. When she's talking about uh, following the ethics rules, I followed every single ethics rules when I was on a power fund. The same rules that the governor followed when she took all those airplane flights with money paid for by big contributors and companies she gave out of state uh, businesses to. Mr. Hubble, I'm going to redirect you back to the question. The and question in is. In regard to the taxes at Yonkers, she may not I'm understand how, you to how the actually the IRS works. A major the IRS study does recently their audits, released. And then the IRS works I'm sorry, Mr. Hubble. Hubble. Mr. Hubble, I'm Mr. sorry, Hubble. Jenna. Go ahead. A major study recently released says the world has 11 years to avoid a climate change catastrophe. Do you agree with that? Do you believe in climate change? And it's reported a, a fact across our globe. I believe in science. And I think that's what all of us in Iowa and around the country want to do, believe in science. Matter of fact, right here in Iowa, over 200 scientists here in our state recently put out a study that they do every year that talks about the impending danger and harm to our economy and to the people of our state if we don't start adapting to changing weather patterns. We need to do that, and we shouldn't ignore it. We need to move, move fast to be able to prepare for climate change, global warming, uh, changing weather patterns, whatever you want to call it. It's happening. 
200 scientists in Iowa say it, so let's believe the science and let's start to prepare for it. But I want to go back to those taxes for just a second because she's raised this Yonkers issue a couple times now. The reality is when you have a tax audit, the audits always assert a certain amount of claims. Yonkers had a tax reserve, which most public companies do. They negotiated with the IRS. The actual change in the reserves was very small. It did not affect uh, the gross income of, of Yonkers at all. It was a perfectly normal situation. All right, Mr. Hubble, I'm sorry, that's too. time, and we all are almost out of time for the debate today. Instead of a closing statement, we're going to end with each candidate responding to the same final question. Winner of the coin toss will answer first, so they will not have the first and the last word today. The question is, the final question, a recent survey shows more than 80% of Iowa voters are worried about the high cost of prescription medication. More than a quarter of Iowan surveyed say they have not filled medication or taken medication they need because it costs too much. What specifically will you do to reduce drug prices? Governor. Is this my close? Or is this final a question? question? Oh, final question. Okay, I don't know if that's my closing. We're not having a closing statement. This is okay. the final question. Each of you gets 60 seconds to answer. Well, we need to do what we can to control the high cost of health care. And that's why, as governor, last year I worked with this legislature to help provide affordable health care for Iowans. For Iowans who couldn't qualify for the subsidies for a, a faltering, unsustainable Obamacare uh, individual health care market, we provided alternative health care options. They couldn't afford a 57% increase, and they were seeing their... Uh, they were paying more for their um, mortgage than they, or for health care than they were for their mortgage, and borrowing money in order to have health care. And that's why we came together and provided Iowans with an alternative, 50% uh, less, and uh, we'll be able to provide them the health care that they need so that they can take care of their families. It was important for working families, for farmers, and for small businesses, and I'm proud to play, proud to have played a role in that. The federal uh, Congress needs to get something done with the drug control prices, but that's what we can do from the state of Iowa. Okay, Mr. Hubble, 60 seconds. Well, as I've said before, health care is one of the top priorities of our administration. Whether it's the fetal heartbeat bill, Medicaid privatization, or what's going on in mental health care, our governors has consistently reduced access to quality, affordable health care across the board for all Iowans. I've worked my, in my career many times trying to expand access to health care. The bill she's talking about, you know, the reality is that that's a Farm Bureau Wellmark plan that the governor supported. It's not even an insurance product. It doesn't cover pre-existing conditions. It doesn't cover a lot of mental health issues. It doesn't cover cancer screenings. And it doesn't cover a lot of things that people aren't going to know about when they buy this policy. And they're not going to be protected on rates or claims by the insurance department. And in the meantime, she got a very big contribution from Wellmark right after she passed that bill. You know, I think we need to do all we can to lower the cost of, of health care, make it more accessible for people. What's going on in our state is happening all across the country with, with the cost of prescription drugs. There's a middleman in between the actual pharmacy and the pharmaceutical companies. They're the ones making a lot right, of Mr. money. Mr. Hubble, that's time. Needs to go and I'm told now that we do have time, time for states. a closing statement from each of you, so we will begin with you, Governor. Well, I have been blessed as the governor of this state and honored to not only travel Iowa, but to travel the world and talk about the amazing things that are happening in this great state. And that wasn't always the case. Eight years ago, Iowans were struggling to find work. The budget was a mess. Education in schools had been cut by the governor that Fred worked with. Iowa is working, and the facts are undeniable. We've been recognized as the number one state in the country. We have the second lowest unemployment rate, third best managed state. Our taxes are going down. Our wages are going up. Our budget is balanced, $127 million surplus, and we're investing like never before in education, job training, and, and uh, health care. I humbly ask for your vote on November 6th to build on the success that we've seen, to keep this economy growing, not to raise taxes, not to raise regulations, not to stifle an economy that's growing, but to keep it okay, moving thank you, Governor. in the right Mr. direction. Mr. Hubble, 60 thank seconds. You. Thank you. Thank you all for watching tonight. You know, we've had a lot of conversation tonight about what we want to do. The Governor just promises more of the same. I promise to bring change. But I want to tell you why I'm here. Almost 30 years ago, my wife and I faced a life-changing experience. We were held hostage on a hijacked plane by three terrorists halfway around the world. Automatic weapons pointed at our faces. Our lives were threatened every day. My wife was held on that plane for six days. I was held for 13 with little to do 
and, and very little certainty. I sat there, I prayed, I thought about what I would do differently if I got a second chance. Ever since then, I wake up most mornings remembering that event, but also motivated to make our state the best place it can be. Unfortunately, today I am very concerned about the direction of our state. Governor Reynolds and I have very different priorities. We need change. If you love Iowa like I do, let's work together to make state government as good and as decent as our people. All right. I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. And thank you to both our candidates today. Thank you for watching. There are two other candidates on the ballot for this race, Libertarian candidate Jake Porter and Gary Sigworth, representing the Clearwater Party of Iowa. Both did not meet KWQC's criteria to appear in this debate, but information about both can be found right now on the KWQC News app and website. We do plan to talk one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Porter later today, and we'll post that interview on our website along with Mr. Sigworth's interview. For those of you watching from other parts of the state, we we will include links to our media partners, KCRG, Quad City Times, WOWT out of Omaha Council Bluffs, and KYOU out of Ottumwa on our own website. Election Day is November 6th. Please remember to get out and vote, and thank you for watching.